Masechet Baba Mesiyah Daf Yod Zayin. More halachot about finding contracts in the marketplace and who you return it to. Amar Rabbi Abhu, Amar Rabbi Yochanan. Amosesh Tarcho Bashuk. Afal Pisha Katu Bo Henpek. Lo Ya Chaziro La Be'alim. In the name of Rabbi Yochanan, we learn that someone that finds a promissory note in the marketplace, even though it has a ratification by the court. One does not return it to the creditors. We'll explain further. I don't even need to teach you that if it doesn't have a ratification uh, by the court, then uh, one does not return it because maybe the borrower wrote this contract but never actually used it. He never went through with the loan. And so if you never actually borrowed the money, then certainly you can't give it to the creditor to then collect the money. That's for sure. The Biochan is teaching us an even bigger chidush. Even if it has a henpek, what is a henpek? A ratification of uh, of the signatures. Whenever a, a document comes to the court, a, a contract, they have to see, are these signatures valid? Let's call them in. Did you sign this document? Or if they're not around, someone that knows them or compare their signature to something else that we know that they signed. So first we have to ratify the document and then, then they put a stamp or they attach another paper on it that says, yes, this is ratified. Um, uh, even, even in that case, see, in that case, we know for sure that the, the, the um, loan went through um, because uh, otherwise they wouldn't be bringing it to court. So surely the borrower did, in fact, give this loan document to the court, so you don't have to worry that there was never a loan, but rather, um, still, you don't return it because maybe it was already paid back and it was the, the, the uh, creditor gave it to the borrower and the bother, borrower is the one that lost it. So therefore, we do not return it to the creditor in either case. But now we challenge this ruling of Rabbi Yochanan. There's the Mishnah that we mentioned yesterday that we're going to be analyzing further in three dapim from now that says any a court document we do return to the creditor because it's processed by the court. So that means it must be real authentic. And so we give it to them. And here, this one is it has a handpick. That means it's a court document. And uh, you, Rabbi Yochanan said, we don't give it to the creditor. But the Mishnah says you should return it to the creditor. And so uh, Rabbi Abu answers to Yirmiya, who's younger, Yirmiya, my son, not all documents that come from a court are the same. Rather, this Mishnah is when, where it says that you do return it, is talking about a case where the debtor um, was, has a status, a presumptive status of being a denier, a liar. In other words, the debtor already lied, could be about a different case, or maybe about this very case, and we caught him lying, maybe witnesses came and said that he's lying, and so when he says, oh, I paid it back, you know what, we just ignore his claim, and that's why in such a case you give it back to the creditor. But in a normal case, most people we presume are honest and reliable. So in a normal case, that's what Rabbi Yochanan was talking about, that you, uh, since it came from the court, you give it to the, cre you do not give it to the creditor, only if the debtor is uh, suspicious, then we do give it to the creditor. Rava asks, wait a second, just because a person has a presumptive status of being a liar one time, does that mean he never pays? I understand. And one, one time, some, some deal that happened uh, last month, he lied and he denied, and so he's not reliable for that. But does that mean that also in the future for this case, he's going to be he's going to be a liar, and now that's it. We assume that he doesn't pay anything ever, right? Sometimes people just they 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 don't pay one bill, but it doesn't mean that they don't pay anybody. Rather, another answer to explain the contradiction between Rabbi Yochanan and the Mishnah, that that the Mishnah is talking about not a loan document, but rather a bill of foreclosure or, or an authorization to, uh, 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 to pay and to take someone's property because they owe such a thing. This is a court document that we mentioned yesterday, and it be Zera on yesterday's daf already said that this Mishnah is specifically talking about 
this type of document of foreclosure. Uh, Rava uh, agreed with Ribi Zera, although he had a slight disagreement about the explanation there, but he agreed that this Mishnah is talking about such a case. In such a case, you don't have to worry that um, this was already foreclosed and then the debtor bought it back um, uh, afterwards and now there now the foreclosure document can be used again you don't have to worry about that as Rava said yesterday because the it's up to the debtor to tear up the foreclosure document or write a new document of sale and so therefore that's a case where um, you don't if, if, it, if it exists then you can assume it's valid and you can give it back to the creditor. That's not the same as Rabbi Yochanan. Rabbi Yochanan is talking about a regular loan document where you do not give it back to the creditor. This is Rava continuing his statement. He says, listen, oh, now that you brought up this topic of a denier, I'm going to add another halacha about this that I also heard. We're going to make a distinction between two, um, uh, two, two uh, la- types of language that a court uses. One is se ten law and chayav ata li ten law. When a court deems that someone is guilty and they say, they give an order to the guilty party, go and pay him. That's an actual order, that's a sentencing, and that's very serious. When they say, that's only their ruling, but they don't actually, it's not yet the, the final verdict and the sentencing, so it's not as, it's not actionable yet, even though they, they express their decision, what their decision is going to be. Um, the person doesn't actually have to go and pay until the court orders him to do so. So we're looking at that distinction. And so Rava says, in the name of Rav Nachman, if the court tells a person who owes money, go and pay, and then that person claims, oh, I already paid, he is believed. Um, because it, we assume that he's not lying. If he says he paid, then he paid, because uh, mo- most of the time, when the court says you have to pay, then the person will pay, and if they said so, we believe them. And therefore, in such a case, if the Malve comes and says, ask the court, can you write me a document of authorization to take his money? We do not write it for him because we believe the debtor that he paid. However, when the court only gives their preliminary ruling and says, you are, you are liable to pay, and and then the creditor, the debtor says, I paid already. He's not believed. That's because we assume that he's just, he's using a delaying tactic. He's not going to, he doesn't want to pay until the final uh, sentencing when he definitely has to. So um, it's not that he's totally lying. Um, he's just saying, I, I paid just so he can delay it further. So that's normal human behavior, even though he shouldn't do that because he's lying. Um, nevertheless, um, uh, we people do that sometimes. Um, so uh, because people do that, so we suspect that when he says he paid, he actually didn't pay because most people do not pay on, at the time of the preliminary ruling. They only pay at the time of the final sentencing. And therefore, if it's not the final sentencing yet, if he did it, if they didn't say se ten law, but they only said chayav etali ten law, and the malve, the creditor, says, can you write me a document of authorization to take the money? Uh, we do write it for him. That is the uh, opinion of Rava, quoting Rav Nachman. However, Rav Zavid, in the name of Rav Nachman, has a different uh, uh, ruling, slightly different. Rav Zavid, Mishmet Rav Nachman, Amar. Ben se aten lo, ben chayav atali ten lo, v'amar parati ne'eman. Ba maved lichtob en kotvin v'notnin lo. No, it doesn't make a difference in the cases that you just mentioned. If the court said either go pay him or you are liable to pay him either the final sentencing or the preliminary ruling, it doesn't matter. We trust him in either case. If he says, I paid, then we trust he paid and the creditor who asks for an authorization, we do not write it for him. Rather, Rather, there is room to distinguish between the two formulas as follows. If a betin issues a court order and says, you have to go and pay to they tell a certain debtor, and the debtor says, I already paid on this time, uh, at this time, on this day, and this place, 
And then witnesses come and say, when? At that, that time? You were, we were with you at that time in that place. And we, you, you did not uh, pay anybody at that time. We, they they uh, contradict him. And he, in fact, did not pay. And then he uh, it says again, that he paid. The debtor says again that he paid. These three words, what's well, the significance of him saying again that he paid? Right, he already said that he, he paid and he's found to be a liar. What does it matter if he says it again? In fact, these three three words seem like they should not be there. And if we check in the manuscripts, we see in the Vilna edition, they are in fact put in parentheses, the Maharshal says to delete them. Uh, they were there in the first printing from 1520 in Venice. Um, and so that's why they're still in the, in the Vilna edition, but they should be deleted and you see here in the Florence and Hamburg the Hamburg manuscript is the most important one the most reliable um, for this Masechet and in several others it's not there only in one Vatican manuscript is there and another Vatican manuscript it's added in uh, so you see this is these three words are on very shaky ground and most likely should not be there so it's correct to um, uh, de delete them as the Maharshal has done all right so it doesn't really matter if he says again that he paid the point is because he claimed to have paid and he is contradicted by two witnesses so now he is assumed to be a liar for this money he's not going to believe that whatever he says about this money he'll have to bring now at the next time proof that he in fact paid However, that's different from Chayava Taliten Lo, Vamar Parati, Vadimedino Toshelon Para, Vechazavan Parati, Lo Sakafran Leoto Mamon. If the court only issued a preliminary ruling and said you are guilty and have to pay, and he says, I already paid, and then there's witnesses that say, no, you did not pay. And we could skip the three next three words again here. It's the same same issue as before. Um, so in that case, he is not considered to have a presumptive status of a liar regarding this case. What's the difference? My tama ishtamutehu dekam mishtamet mine sabad adem ayenu bi rabanan bedini. Because when he says I paid. We uh, we can assume that he didn't really mean to uh, reject the the claim and never pay. He was just buying time. He was just trying to evade because he said to himself, you know what? Until the sages actually uh, give the final ruling, investigate it further, and tell me I have to uh, uh, give me an or sentencing order. Then I'll pay, but in the meantime, I, I, I'll deny. Like uh, nowadays, when someone comes to guilt to court, they say, they say not guilty. Of course, they say not guilty. Everybody says not guilty. Let the other side prove that I'm guilty, and then I'll pay. Um, so in, in that case, uh, we don't consider. But in this case, it's not just that he's not going to pay ever. He's fin he's just buying time. He doesn't have the money right now. He plans very. He plans to pay. If he admits it all now, then he's going to have to pay immediately. Since he doesn't have the money, so he says, "Oh, I paid already." And then he buys him some time, but he was always considered considering uh, that he's going to pay. And therefore, he's not considered a liar, a denier uh, uh, for the future. <laughs> Uh, along the same lines, Rabbi Yochanan teaches. If someone comes with a claim and says, you have a hundred dollars that you owe me, and the other, sense, other person says, I don't have anything of yours, you never lent me anything. And then witnesses come and say that, yes, he did, in fact, this loan went through, and you borrowed this hundred dollars from the other guy. And so now the debtor changes his story and says, oh, you're right, I did borrow, but I paid it back. So we don't believe him, right? He's changing his story, and now he's considered to be, have a chazaka, of being a liar regarding this case. We're not going to believe anything he says about this case in the future. When he does, if he's found guilty and then he pays, and when he do, or when he eventually does pay, he'll have to do it in front of witnesses that can testify so, because we're not going to believe any claim he makes about it. Now we have a story about this man named Shabbatai. He's the son of a rabbi. It doesn't say he's a rabbi himself. And he wrote, to his daughter-in-law in her ketuba that he's going to give her this cloak of fine wool and he accepted upon himself to be a guarantor for the payment of this uh, item in the ketuba it cast ketubata in the end the ketuba was lost and then this uh, his daughter-in-law comes and says oh, you said that you're going to give me a cloak 
right? Said in the Ketubah, he says, what, what cloak? I never promised that. I don't know what you're talking about. He's lying. Atusa Deva Amre in Ketabla. Witnesses came. They were there at the Ketubah signing. There we saw it. You said, promised that you're going to give her a cloak. So then the father-in-law says, Oh, yeah, I did write that. But you know what? I gave it to you already. So the case came to the Bichiyah. And Bichiyah said, You are now considered a liar regarding this cloak. All right? And you have to give it. And you have to make sure to give it with witnesses because we're not going to believe any claim that you make in the future regarding this cloak. Amar Rabbi Abba, Abba Amar Rabbi El'a, Amar Rabbi Yochanan, also in the name of Yochanan, another law. Haya chayav l'chavero shibu'a, v'ha'ma nishpa'ati, v'hadim me'edin oto shelo nishpa'a, v'chaza v'ha'ma nishpa'ati, hu'sa kafran l'ota shibu'a. Um, if someone had to give, make a vow to his friend, they're in court, and it's such a situation where um, the court obligates him to make a vow. And then the uh, the defendant says, oh, I already made this vow. But witnesses come and say, well, when did you make that vow? Right? On this day? No, we were there. You never made such a vow. And he said, I made the vow. These words, again, we can delete because it's, uh, it's the same pattern as from before. Um, uh, so he is now considered a liar regarding that shivua, just like you can be con- get the chazaka of being a liar regarding certain certain money, so too also regarding a certain shivwa, you could be considered a liar. Now this halacha was repeated in front of Rabbi Abhu. Rabbi Abhu said that this halacha that Rabbi Abin said in the name of Rabbi Yochanan, it makes sense regarding a shivwa that a betin comes and says, you have to make that vow. And he says, I already made the vow. And then uh, witnesses come and say he didn't. Then we has, he gets a presumption of being a liar. However, in a case where a person volunteered on his own, he says, oh, you don't believe me that I paid? I'll make a vow. Uh, outside of court, he made that, he, he, he guaranteed. And then afterwards he says, I made the vow already, but witnesses come and say, uh, not so. In that case, he would not be considered a, a, a liar. Now, the printed edition say Ne'eman, that he will be believed that he made a vow. But this word Ne'eman is in brackets. And again, here, if we check the scoreboard, uh, you see this word in brackets does not appear in any other manuscript, and not in the, especially not in the Hamburg manuscript. The reason why Hamburg is the best is because it was not written in Hamburg, but actually it's a Sephardic manuscript. It's the only Sephardic manuscript that we have. All right, if you click here, you see that this is, um, uh, the rest are all Ashkenazi manuscripts, um, but also from internal evidence, the Hamburg is the most accurate manuscript. In this case, it doesn't really matter because no manuscripts, not even the first printed edition, has the word Ne'eman. So uh, therefore, uh, we can, uh, we am not sure how that got in there, um, uh, but the idea here is not that he is believed to say that he made a vow. There are two witnesses that said he didn't make a vow, but the point is simply that he's not considered to be a liar uh, in the future because of this. Um, and the reason why this is different is because um, when a person says, I'll make a vow, so he doesn't have to make a vow right then. It could be that he intends to make a vow. Now, the witnesses said, say, you, did, you haven't made a vow yet. But he might be thinking to himself, okay, I'll make a vow later on, right? Because this is an unofficial vow. So he may still uh, take it later on. And the fact that he said, I took it already, is only to buy time that he doesn't want to take this vow just yet. So that's why um, this is uh, this is different from when it's in Betin. Um, what Rabbi Abu said in regarding this distinction of in, in court and out of court, they came and told that to Rabbi Abin, who said the tradition in the first place, and he said, "Yes, I agree. That's what I meant. Um, I only said this halacha when it's a when it's a." A vow in Betin, because then you have to say it right then and there in front of the Betin, and then you claim that you already did it, and you, you're lying, you're found to be a liar, now you're not trusted at all. But for a voluntary um, a vow, maybe you're just delaying, and you're not considered a liar. We have another tradition in the name of Yohanan that says the same thing. Now, 
Ata Shibua. This is the same words, but here it adds in the word Betin. If someone had to make a vow to his friend in Betin, and he said, I already made the vow, and witnesses came and said, no, you didn't, and then, and he says, I did already. Again, these words are not in the good manuscripts, so we don't have to uh, worry about them. Uh, he is assumed, presumed to be a, a liar regarding that vow. Amar Rabbi Asi, Amar Rabbi Yochanan, Hamoseh Shtarcho Bashuk, Vechatub Bo Henpek, Vechatub Bo Zemano, Bo Bayom Yachaziru La Be'alim. Another statement in the name of Rabbi Yochanan. If someone finds a loan document in the marketplace and it has a ratification from a court on it, and it also has a time uh, on it, and the date is that very, has a date on it, and the date says the same day, you find it on the same day. Right, it's um, uh, Rosh Chodesh Nisan, and it says in the date, and you find it on Rosh Chodesh Nisan. So then, you should give it back to the creditor. Why? Are you going to worry that maybe the borrower wrote the document but never actually used it, never got the loan? No, it can't be because it has a ratification. That means it was given to the lender, and the lender already brought it to court. If you're worried that he paid it back already. Uh, the, the, the borrower paid it back. No, that's very unusual for a person to pay back a loan on the same day that he took it. Well, he borrowed $100 in the morning and then pay back already in the afternoon, a document with a loan and all, with a, do, a loan with a document and all that. That's unusual and therefore we do not suspect that. So therefore we give it back to the creditor. And now we have a question. Did Rabbi Yochanan really say this? That you wouldn't, a person wouldn't pay a loan back on the same day. Look at the what look at the following. I heard from you directly that you said in the name of Rabbi Yochanan, if uh, you have a loan document that was issued once and paid back. This, and has the same, and the same two people want to make another loan. You cannot use the same document. Why? Because once, when you use it once, the lien that is that is, is uh, that the uh, that the document is written, the the lien that is written in the document is already forgiven. It was the borrower wrote a document for loan, a loan in the morning, hundred dollars, and you have a lien on my land. Okay, then he paid it back. So now the lien is gone. If you use it again, there won't be any the, there won't be any lien on it. So therefore, you should don't don't use a document twice. Go write another one. Now, uh, Emat Rabbi Zera says, what kind of case oh, is it, was Rabbi Yochanan talking about? Budo. If we're talking about a case where the first loan was on Rosh Chodesh uh, Nisan, and then they, he wants they want to use it again on the second day of Nisan or the third day of Nisan, right? Yom Yom Acher, any other day. Well, then, even without the reason of that the lien was forgiven. Still, you wouldn't be able to use the same document. Because we would already know it's not allowed because you cannot use an antedated uh, document. As the Mishnah in the Shavit says, if you have a document with that that's dated earlier than the actual transaction, it's no good, right? This is a problem in the loan because now you, he's going to collect from uh, a sold property from the early date that really the creditor does not have a right to. He only has a right to sold property from the date of the loan. And so you can't use an antedated uh, document anyway. So you don't have to worry that it's from a different date. Elala biome. Rather, the Biochanan must have said that you can't use the same document document on the same day, right, because there's no more lien on it. Um, therefore, you see that according to Biochanan, it does happen sometimes that a person pays back a loan on the very same day, right? Because that's the case that he's, this, this halacha is about. He had a document in the morning, Right here, um, uh, you, I, I, I borrowed from you a hundred dollars. You have a lien on my land, and then Rabbi Yochanan says, "Don't use it again." Meaning, don't use it on the same day. Well, you can only use it again if the first loan was repaid, and now you want to borrow again in the afternoon. So you see, according to Rabbi Yochanan, um, people sometimes do pay back on the same day, 
Rabbi Yase answered, Amar le mi ka'amina de la pare kelal, de la shechiche ina she de pare biome ka'amina. Rabbi Yase says, I didn't say that no one ever pays back on the same day. It's just that it's not common for a person to pay back on the same day. Therefore, if you find a document that says on it, Rosh Chodesh Nisan, and you find it on Rosh Chodesh Nisan, the very same day, then you can assume that it hasn't be, been repaid yet because most of the time people don't pay, repay. Does it happen? Yeah, sometimes it happens. You just need a short-term loan just to cover an expense in the morning. And then if that's the case and you need another loan after that, don't use the same document on the same day. Uh, don't use, don't reuse a loan document ever. Rav Kahana Amar, Keshechayav Modeh. Rav Kahana has a different explanation of the Biochanan's ruling that if you find a document on the same day at, that it was written, you return it to the uh, creditor and you don't worry that it was paid back. Even though the Biochanan elsewhere said that people do sometimes pay back loans on the very same day, Rav Kahana explains that the Biochanan only issued that ruling that you give it back to the creditor when the debtor admits that he owes the money, right? We find this document and we go to the debtor. What is this? Oh yeah, I owe the money. Uh, you can give it back to him. Okay, we ask, If that's the case, then isn't that obvious, right? The creditor said he owes the money. So then obviously you're going to give it back. The debtor admitted that he owes the money. Obviously you're going to give the document back to the creditor. Oh, because I might have thought that you shouldn't give it back to the creditor because um, the debtor might be saying, I paid it back. The, the debtor may, may in fact have paid it back. And the, why does he say, I didn't pay it back? Because he wants to go and and borrow again on that very same day from the same lender, and he says, you know what? I'm gonna claim that I didn't pay it back because I'll that way I could use the same loan document for the second loan, and I won't have to pay another scribe's fee. Every time you go to the scribe, they she charges you twenty bucks to write up another document. Well, I already borrowed from this guy this morning and, and paid him back. So really, now this loan document is no good. But I want it to be good, so I could save twenty bucks on the next loan that I'm going to make this afternoon with the same person. And therefore, you know what? I'll just say, yeah, I still own the money. And then people will think it's the same loan. But uh, me and him, we know it's actually for a new loan. We save twenty bucks. So um, now, why don't worry about that? Because Kamash Malan, the Im Ken Malve Gufe La Shebak, Sabar Shamri, Bi Rabanan, Mafsedili. You don't have to worry about that because the lender himself uh, is not going to uh, uh, agree to that because the lender knows that this document is invalid. You can't reuse a document. And then he's worried. Maybe the rabbis will find out about it and they will uh, nullify the entire document. And then I won't be, won't be able to uh, collect my money at all. So you don't have to worry that the borrower is going to use this trick because the lender won't agree to it anyway and therefore if you find the document and the borrower says yeah i agree then you can you can give it to the lender now we ask uh how is what you said different from um the discussion we had back in the mishnah earlier that says if you find a loan document if it has a lien on it, then do not return it to the lender. And we said that that's talking about a case where the borrower admits that he owes. And we asked, how come you don't return it even though the borrower admits that he owes? Because maybe he drafted this document in Nisan where, when he was thinking about it, but he didn't end up borrowing money until Tishrei. And now the uh, creditor will come and collect, m m collect land that had been sold between Nisan and Tishrei illegally, because really the lien only starts at the time of the loan in Tishrei, but the document is, is predated, um, and that's not okay. So we cannot give it back to the creditor because that might affect the buyers of that land unfairly. Um, so how come uh, uh, we worried about that there? And uh, Rav Kana is not worried about that. Why don't we apply Rav Kahana's worry 
also to this halacha, the, the one that back on Dafyud Bet, and we don't say, and Rav Kana doesn't say there also that the lender would all, not himself not allow this because and, and instead he would say, no, write a doon document. What is this? It says Nisan on it? That's from back then when you were thinking of borrowing? No, you better write a new one um, because if that says Tishrei on it because otherwise the rabbis might find out about this and they will disqualify the whole loan, the whole note, and I won't be able to collect. So why don't we say the same thing there? And since you don't have to worry because the lender won't allow such a thing to happen, then when you find it, you could give it back to the uh, the lender. But the Mishnah and the discussion back there, we didn't say that, Rav Kahana. And the answer is, Amri, Hata Mishum Deit Le Rav Ha Deka Tarif Lakohot Minisan Ve'atishte Menach Nichale. In that case, um, the lender has a benefit because with, with this document, even though it's false, he can use it to collect uh, um, sold property back from Nisan until Tishrei. So we know he's not going to say anything, and he'll take that risk. Uh, yeah, it could be the rabbis will find out and they'll nullify it, but in the meantime, uh, maybe they won't find out. And now he gets he has more guarantee for his loan. So Veloma Velomedi doesn't say anything. However, Hacha Kevan Delet Leravcha here the lender has no benefit. The soft soft shetarahi It was it was written on the same day. Maika de katarif lakochot. What sold property is will he be able to uh, to collect from if he uses the same document rather than uh, a, a new one? Bishtashin imchal shibudo lashabik. So therefore, he's not going to uh, allow himself to accept a loan document that is already used and actually has no lien on it because the very same day. So it's in the lender's interest to get a new document that will be to- totally valid. And it, he still can collect from the very same uh, property of the borrower because it's still written on the very same day. And now we have yet another law from Rabbi Yochanan. Rabbi Yochanan bar Abba Amar Rabbi Yochanan HaToen Achar Maaseh Betin Lo Amar Kelum. If a court issues a ruling and then someone says, "Oh, I paid it already," we do not believe him. My Ta'ama Kol Maaseh Betin Keman De Nakid Shetara Bide Dame. Any ruling of the court, any court enactment, is as if uh, they, uh, someone is holding a promissory note in his hand, so you have to pay. Right? It's right there in front of you. The word Ma. The phrase Maase Betin here means something different from what we've um, been seeing above. Above, Maase Betin meant a court ordered document. Like they say, you have an authorization to go and take that this property. Um, or a document that they uh, they themselves have ratified and signed. Um, here it means something different. Here it's talking about um, something that the Betin, in general, the rabbis made an enactment like uh, a payment of Ketubah. Even if you don't actually have a ketubah, still there's a requirement of the husband to pay what's in, what would be in a ketubah. So these are things that Betin has decided that one has to pay. And so the idea here is that um, if there is a, a, um, a requirement, a responsibility of someone to pay something that's an enactment of the Betin, even if there's no actual document present, still it's as if there's a document present because the Betin requires such payments. Tells Rabbi Yochanan, why do you have to teach this halacha? Isn't it obvious from a Mishnah in Masechet Ketubot that if a woman produces a get, even though she doesn't have a ketubah, she can collect her ketubah. The fact that she was divorced is proof that she was divorced, and then any woman who's divorced gets to collect a ketubah. So even if she doesn't have a physical ketubah, she gets to pay it. So you see, this is a ma'ase betin. Right, the responsibilities of a husband uh, to pay kitubah is a maase betin, and so you can you see from here that even without the document, we make her pay, we make him pay. So Rabbi Yochanan, why do you need to tell us that? We know this from the Mishnah. Rabbi Yochanan has a fantastic line here. If not that I had picked up the shard for you, you would not find the pearl underneath. Um, in other words, you would not have realized that this Mishnah tells us this chidush, if not that I pointed it out to you, right? A, a good teacher, you know, he puts all the facts and 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 uh, and the hints and it sets up all the uh, information, and then the student says, "Oh, look what I found!" As if the student found it. Yeah, that's only because the teacher set everything up perfectly. 
um, so that this would be the logical next step. So Rabbi Yochanan says, of course I had to stay, say what I did, um, otherwise you wouldn't have realized that that Mishnah is so. That Mishnah just says, okay, if there is a get, then you have to pay the kitubah. But I'm, I'm showing the, a more general rule from this that any ma'asebeti and anything that the rabbis require someone to pay, even without a contract, uh, present, one has to pay. argues with this uh, uh, principle. Um, this so-called uh, uh, pearl. He says, what pearl is there? Um, you, you can't derive the Rabbi Yochanan's law from the Mishnah because maybe that Mishnah is talking about a case only where the custom is not to write a Ketubah. There were some places that they didn't write a Ketubah. It was assumed. And therefore, if you're in a place where no Ketubah is written and the woman produces a get, then that's, a, that's, the, that's the Ketubah. That's the proof that she was divorced and she has to be paid. However, if you live in a place where it's customary to write a kitubah, then only if she actually has a kitubah, she gets paid, otherwise not. And so from this Mishnah, we would not be able to derive that anytime there is, the rabbis require a responsibility like a husband paying, uh, the, paying the, the wife after the end of the marriage, um, uh, that uh, is not necessarily true from this Mishnah, that, um, the, that, that, that the requirement of the Betin uh, needs to be paid even without a Ketubah, right? One could not, in fact, learn it from this Mishnah. That's what Abayah said at first. But then he changed his mind and he said, you know what? Scratch that. If you would think that only in a place where it's customary not to write a ketubah, that's where the Mishnah says a get can be used to collect ketubah payment. But if you live in a place where they are, it's customary to write a ketubah, then if she has a ketubah document, she can collect. Otherwise not. That's what Abaya had said right over here. Well, if so, what about a widow from Edusin? You have a man and a woman. They did kiddushin. Um, only, and then the man died. So uh, the law is that his heirs, his estate, has to pay a ketubah. Even though they never comp- finalized the marriage with Nisuin, uh, still, even uh, what, just with, uh, with uh, Kiddushin, one, uh, she deserves a ketubah. And here, what ketubah would there be? Generally, they would write a ketubah uh, sometime after the Kiddushin, uh, before or, or, or at the time of the Nisuin. That's when they write the ketubah. So here, this Almana, she does not have a ketubah, but we know that she deserves to get paid a ketubah amount. So it must be, in fact, as was said above, that um, you can derive from this Mishnah, uh, the law of Rabbi Yochanan, that in fact, even without a physical ketubah, which she, a woman can collect a ketubah, even in a place where it's normal to write a ketubah, like here, it's normal to write a ketubah, but... And Almana, she does, her ketubah is not written yet, and yet she does get to collect it. And be'adem mitad ba'alit on velema peratiha v'chitem ha'chiname imken ma'ho'ilu chachamim betakanatan. And if you say that in this case the widow who are from from Edusin, oh, she can collect her ketubah amount based on the testimony, the witnesses that said they saw that her husband had died, and that'll be the equivalent of someone coming in with a ketubah, or a divorcee coming in with a get. And so she also, in fact, has something. Here's witnesses that he died, so therefore I get a ketubah. But in that case, since she has no documentation, only witnesses, then the heirs of the husband could always say, we paid her already, and uh, then they'd have to be believed. Now, and if you say, yes, indeed, we believe the heirs to say that they paid, well, in that case, what benefit, what did the rabbis accomplish through their enactment? They made an enactment that um, even before uh, Nisuin, even if they only have Kiddushin and the husband dies, then he has to, the heirs have to pay Ketubah. What good would that ordinance be if the heirs could always just claim, oh, uh, we paid it already, and she would have no recourse because the Ketubah is not written yet, she doesn't have a document like you get, all she has is witnesses, but the witnesses don't know if it's paid or not, and so he just says it was paid, and then she's left with, with, with nothing. So therefore, you see that it's not because we're relying on the witnesses um, uh, or on the get or on the ketubah, but in fact, as Rabbi Yochanan said, 
at, at the at the top of this sugya that uh, uh, someone can a woman can collect her ketubah and in fact any case of a maaseh betin anything that the betin that the rabbis in general have made an enactment someone has to pay that person will have to pay even if they don't have a physical document because the enactment of a betin is in in place of is as strong as actually holding a promissory note. Baruch Adonai Amen v'amen.